Back when we lived in Chicago, uh, when we had internet, <laughs> our subdivision does not have internet. Yeah, long story. All right. Back when we had internet, my children, I think about two of them, they would rather watch videos on YouTube of children playing with toys rather than play with toys. And before you start criticizing my children, how many of you would rather watch cooking shows than cook? I see you. You could actually be cooking, but it's easier to watch someone else cook. My kids could be playing, but it's easier to watch someone else play. And the same could be said by the last several weeks if we've been covering the fruit of the Spirit. We see all these virtues that are inspirational. And yet, they're not just here to inspire us. They're to call us to obey. So let's just not show up and be inspired, but let's go out there and do and live these virtues by the power of the Spirit. And that brings us to this morning on the virtue of gentleness. This past week, I watched a documentary on Fred Rogers. You know him as Mr. Rogers. And I don't know if there's ever been a, a human being created who is so gentle with kids. And as I was watching this documentary and his gentleness with kids, I was thinking to myself, I just don't want to watch this. I want to live this. I would love to be as gentle with my kids as he is with kids in general. So as I think about this gentleness and my desire for God to empower me to be gentle, I am praying and hoping the same for you today, that you will hear the word and go out and do it and display gentleness. And we're going to talk about gentleness and the grittiness of life and some areas you may have not ever thought about to display gentleness. And we're going to do it by looking at 1 Peter chapter 3. And if you know anything about Peter, he is one of those apostles that you would not nail down as gentle. So apparently something has happened inside Peter where he shows up now after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the filling of the Holy Spirit, and he's talking about gentleness in 1 Peter chapter 3. Now as we look through these 17 verses, yes, it is a lot of text this morning, Peter will tell you, that before you display gentle actions, there needs to be something that happens in your mind and in your heart. And the way we're going to cover it this morning is we're going to talk about a humble mind, a tender heart, and then we'll get around to the action of, of gentle hands and speech and our actions. So let's start with a humble mind. Let's jump in the middle of 1 Peter 3. Start with verse 8. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. A lot of these virtues run together, but let's lock in on the fact that gentleness comes out of a person with a humble mind. Notice at the very end of verse 8 where it says, humble in spirit. Some of your translations may say humble in mind. Because if you're harsh with others, then chances are that you have a proud mind. And to have a proud mind means that you are putting your agenda before others. If you yell at someone or, or go off on someone, apparently you have put your agenda before them. Maybe you yell at your neighbor who's being too loud. Or, taking it to another level, maybe you're driving and you are secretly cussing at the other drivers on the road because they have evaded, invaded your agenda. And when Peter talks about this humble mind or this mind that is a humble in spirit, he's talking about adopting another agenda, and that agenda is not your own, but that is the agenda of God. And so when you find yourself lashing out or angry or irritable this next week, ask yourself, who agenda are you following, your own or the Lord's. 
Well, let's keep going. We're gonna move on from a a tender in this, uh, this humble mind to a tender heart. Look at verse eight again. Verse eight, it says, kind hearted or a tender heart. One of my favorite scholars, Wayne Grudem, says this about a tender heart. He says, caring, compassionate, not only in actions, but even more in one's feelings or emotions. You know that the Spirit of God is starting to do a work when you, inside of you when you feel tender-hearted towards others. You know God's doing something when you start to feel empathy and sympathy towards the brokenness of other people. It's when you start to realize that people are fragile. And when you get that, it changes your heart. When we were in Chicago, my wife and I were doing a garage sale, and some of the things we were looking at in our garage is we had this box full of our wedding glasses that were very fragile. And, you know, my wife and I are not very good packers, and so we just had that stuff in there with some towels, and it was all clinging together, and we're picking it up, and we're thinking, we have to be careful, or are we going to shatter these things before we can cash in on them? So <laughs> we're taking up our stuff. It's clanging. It's, it's fragile. And, and that's, that's the concept when you're dealing with people. You have to realize that people are fragile. And if you're not careful in your words and in your actions, you can crack them. You can break them. That's why you have to have a heart that's tender, that's not only saying, okay, I'm going to understand this intellectually, but I'm going to feel this tender heart towards you and the way I act towards you. So before Peter even talks about any actions, we've not talked about any actions, he's saying your mind needs to be humble, God's agenda and your heart needs to be tender toward other people. Understand they are fragile. But now he moves into some actions. And in these actions, this is going to be fun. We're going to look at some stuff that Peter covers as he's branching off of this humble mind and tender heart. And some of the areas he's going to cover are the husband-wife relationship. He's going to also talk about how you can be gentle when someone else is harsh with you. And he's also going to talk about how you can be gentle when people are pushing back against your faith. But first we want to start and talk about the husband-wife relationship because it seems like almost more than any other relationship, there can be opportunities to be gentle or opportunities to be harsh. Think back to your interactions with your spouse just this weekend. How did it go? Were they all gentle? Or do you want to crawl under the pew in conviction? (laughs) Even if you're not married, you can think about, okay, this is the kind of heart and mind and actions I want to show toward other people. So let's start looking through the passage, and I want you to understand what we're about to cover is very controversial, and I love it. Let's go. 1 Peter 3, verse 1. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. The way that God has set up the husband and wife relationship is the husband is supposed to sacrificially lead like Christ does to the church, and the wife is to submit to his leadership as the church submits to Christ. My last church I left, mainly young people, and I would do weddings from time to time, and I had one particular wedding sermon where I would only give the groom one word and the bride one word to think about every day the rest of their married life. Because on the day of the wedding, they're not thinking about what I'm saying, so I had to give them each one word to think about. And the word I would give to the wife was the word help. Help. She has been created to be his helper. And she's to think, how can I serve and help him? And part of that includes submission. For the most part, the congregation was all stirred up and they would hear these things and they hear the submission word and they would freak out. But I think they should be freaking out on the word I gave to the husband. And that was the word death. Death. Every day of his married life, he is to think death. Not that he wants to die and get away from this woman, but he is to think death in the way that he has served her because as Christ has sacrificially served the church, so the husband is to imitate Christ in serving his wife sacrificially every single day of his life. 
Now you would think that this would be the most controversial calling husbands to death to serve their wife, but no. The most controversial one was help, specifically help through submission. So let me explain this terminology of submission. It does not mean that men and women are not equal. They are. This does not mean that women are to submit to all the men in the world, or it does not mean that at work she can't be the boss. But at, but at home, she is to follow the leadership of her husband. Does not mean that she never to speak or to have input or to have an opinion. And this also does not mean that she is to follow him into sin. It also does not mean that she is to endure an abusive relationship. No. But the man is called to be the leader. Even if the husband is not a believer, according to this passage, she is not to badger him, but to win him over with her godly life. The passage continues as we move into gentleness. Look at verse 2. As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry, or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality, here it is, of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. And it's not saying that women cannot dress up, but more importantly, it is the dressing up the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit. Now, the opposite is the nagging wife that we find in Proverbs. The woman we find in Proverbs is cranky, she is mean, argumentative, and makes her husband want to live on the corner of the roof what the Bible says. <laughs> that attitude is not precious in God's sight and can cause a lot of problems, as you may know. Now, there's this interesting article that I read by a woman. Her name is Gabrielle Reese, who is a professional volleyball player, and she is married to the professional surfer Laird Hamilton. They got married in 1997, the same year we got married. But four years into her marriage, she filed for a divorce. But they never went through with it. Because what happened is she had a change in her view of gender roles and the forms of service. And a few years after that, she stirred up a lot of controversy by something she said. And before I tell you what she said, let me tell you about this girl. She's 6'3", professional volleyball player. In fact, she leads a exercise class in Manhattan that will give you lots of muscles or it will kill you. She is not a picture of a weak woman. This is what she said that was so controversial, that was on all the talk shows, you could read about it all the time. This is what she said. To be truly feminine means being soft, receptive, and look out, here it comes, submissive. And when women heard her say that, they were so upset. In fact, her friend said, you might as well have said that you worship the devil. But for her and in her marriage, it meant that she adopted a service-oriented role. And with a tender heart and a humble mind, the wives can submit to the leadership of their husbands and adopt a service-oriented role and you may be surprised on how your marriage might change with a gentle and quiet spirit that is precious in God's sight. Now we should move on to the husbands. I'd rather not, but let's go ahead and move on to the husbands. Verse 7. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Now, don't be thrown off by the wording of 
with someone weaker since she's, well, don't, don't, don't be thrown off by that. It's, it's not saying that she's lesser, as she's an heir with her husband of eternal life. This weakness is probably a reference to physical strength in general, which men can take advantage of and can turn into abuse, which we see quite often in our culture. But rather than abuse, the husband is to show honor and to live with their wives, do you see it? In an understanding way. Husbands are to be sensitive to the needs and concerns of their wives. They are to be gentle with their wives and in their speech and tone. Now, husbands, I want you to pay attention right now. Part of the reason you don't want to be harsh, mean, and cruel is at the very end of verse 7, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Guys, if you're harsh with your wife, God is not going to answer your prayers. In fact, I'm not going to listen to you. You may show up to pray, but God's got this block on you because you're harsh with your wife. You may think it's totally disconnected that you can treat your wife one way and then come before the Lord, even come here on Sunday morning, start praying, and God's like, yeah, that's cool. Not at all. Because there is a connection by the way you treat your wife. By the way, God's going to deal with you in your prayers. And so if you find yourselves being harsh with your wife, then you'll find yourselves, God, not paying attention to your prayers. Now, I want to make sure that we don't mess up this submission leadership language. I want to tell you a story about one of my favorite scholars who I mentioned earlier. His name's Wayne Grudem. Some of you may know, know him. He wrote the Systematic Theology. Really good book, by the way. Well, he was a top professor at Trinity up in Chicago. But then his wife had a terrible accident And the after effect of that accident was her body hurt all the time. But when they would travel from Chicago down to Phoenix, and she was in Phoenix in the warm weather, her body was fine. So imagine Wayne Grudem on top of his game at Trinity, well known throughout the world. And that's cold up there, by the way, in Chicago. But in Phoenix, his wife is fine. And as he's thinking about this, One day he's reading Ephesians 5.28, which is very similar to our passage today. Ephesians 5.28 says this, So husbands ought also to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. And so Wayne started thinking, well, if my body was hurting, I would take care of it. So I should take care of my wife's body. So what they ended up doing, they moved from one of the top seminaries in the world to a dinky seminary in Phoenix with a few professors. In fact, Wayne Grudem's own personal library was bigger than the school's library. That is loving your wife sacrificially. That is living with your wife in an understanding way. And I know that sometimes when you get to this point in your life, and by that I mean older, you have, may have developed these ruts and these patterns where you go at each other, and that's just the way you exist. And you may think, we try to deal with it in our 30s and our 40s and our 50s, and that's just the way we go at each other. Do you just want to be inspired today, or do you want to actually do the Word of God? My brothers and sisters, don't hear. Let's obey. Let's change this atmosphere in our homes from one of harshness and bitterness to one of grace and gentleness. Well, let's now move into this idea of harsh criticism. How do you respond to gent- with gentleness when someone else is harsh to you? Well, look at verse 9. Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You do not have to strike back at harsh critics. 
with a tender heart and a humble mind, the Word of God is saying that you can bless them instead. You don't have to speak evil back to them or stir up trouble. The Word of God says you can seek peace and pursue it. In fact, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous as the ears are attendant to their prayers. And I would say this is probably one of the most difficult ones in how it plays out. Because my issue is, if you're called to be gentle to those who are harsh, how are you gentle to those who are harsh when you have a leadership position? For example, what if you're a leader in the church and someone is sinfully critical? Or at work, someone is critical and harsh towards you. Or maybe in your own family and it's tearing others apart. If you are in a position of authority, how do you handle harsh critics who are out to bring you and others down? How do you do that? And I think there's got to be this, this, this weaving by the Spirit, this helpful balance where you, you speak the truth, but you're still out to bless them and not tear them down. You speak the truth in love, but you're still out to bless them and not tear them down. Here's an example. Henry Cloud tells a story of a CEO in his book, Boundaries for Leaders. And the CEO was a founder of a manufacturing company, and he was making plans to turn the business over to his son. But one day as he walked through the factory, he noticed his son berating the employees. In fact, his son was being very harsh and making fun of the employees. And the father, who was going to turn the business over to his son, brought his son into the office. And this is what he said to his son. He said, son, I'll wear two hats around here with regard to you. And I'm going to tell you about these two hats. Let me put my first hat on. You're fired. I've warned you about this before. I told you you should not talk to other employees about this. I gave you chance after chance after chance. You're done. You're fired. And then he said, now I'm going to put my second hat on. Son, I heard you just lost your job. How can I help? <laughs> you see that combination, speaking the truth, and yet tender, wanting to bless, though it's funny. There's a combination. How does that work in real life? Yes, and in your families, at work, at church, speak the truth, and yet still be tender and want to bless. So the last one we're going to come back is some challenges to your faith. What do you do when people start challenging your faith? How do you respond with gentleness? Well, let's look it up. Verses 13, famous passage here. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asked you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. As we interact with others and we share the gospel, we are to do it with gentleness and reverence. And I guarantee you that people, even in the village, will say something harsh about Jesus, about your faith, about your church, and we are told to speak the truth in love. But if you're anything like me, gentleness and respect is often lacking in our interactions with the world over truth. When my oldest son started high school, I knew as I stuck him into a public school in Chicago, in the Skokie area, I knew that he was going to get challenges to his faith. They came the second week when a teacher asked the whole class to do a homework assignment to explain how Genesis 1 was written as a myth. And when he came home and told me that, I got all uptight and aggressive and I'm like it's on 
it is on. You tell her that it's not a myth. If she gives you an F, then I'm gonna go talk to her and I'm gonna talk to administration. It's like at that point, I'm ready to hire a lawyer. I'm ready to go on national news. I'm looking for a Supreme Court decision over a homework assignment. I was ready to fight. But my son just shows up the next day, prepared. Nothing became of it. He just kept on standing on the truth throughout the years in high school. But his dad was ready to fight. I don't think that's the gentleness and respect talking about here. Sometimes I feel like we as Christians can be very arrogant. It's like we're ready to fight anybody by any means necessary to bring down the opponents. If I'm reading this rightly, it's talking about giving a good answer, truthful answer with gentleness and respect. But if you're anything like me, as you look at all these areas of husband and wife and dealing with others who are critical of you and dealing with the world, you'll see that it's challenging to operate with gentleness. If you're anything like me, you have probably been harsh recently, angry, irritable at others. Well, what can we do? We want the Spirit of God to move through us. How can we be changed internally in our hearts and our minds? Here's a good word from Jesus. Jesus once said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, He said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I believe that Jesus even wants to be gentle with those of you who are harsh. And he wants to forgive you your sins. I believe that you can come to Jesus this morning in all your meanness. You can come to him with all your sin of your anger and wrath and you can look at the cross and on the cross, the anger and the wrath of the Father is on the Son instead of you. And as the anger and wrath is on the Son instead of you, you can find forgiveness. You can find forgiveness in Jesus Christ and you can be changed inwardly. You can find forgiveness, and by God's grace, you can walk out of here and demonstrate gentleness. And gentleness happens in the ordinary nature of life. In fact, I guarantee you, you will have opportunities today and the rest of the week to demonstrate gentleness. There will come in times that you don't even think about it. Those are opportunities for gentleness. Pastor's kids are usually the worst kind of kids. They're known to be very rebellious. And you may wonder, why are pastor kids so rebellious? It's because the dad is hypocritical. He says one thing on Sunday morning, and he demonstrates something else during the week. So it looks like this morning I'm giving my children an opportunity for full-blown rebellion. That's why I need grace. That's why I need forgiveness. That's why I need power and Holy Spirit's power to demonstrate gentleness in all the different avenues during the week. Because opportunities for gentleness abound. Last night, family and I went to dinner with uh, Richard and Mary Ellen Mathias at Hibachi Sushi Buffet. Never been there before. By the way, we do not eat sushi. Did not touch that stuff. (laughs) But as I think there, driving there with my packed van full of my kids, that that is an opportunity for gentleness. The simple outing has an opportunity for me to be gentle with my kids, between me and my wife. How did it go? I'm not going to say. But opportunities abound this week, abound today. And by God's grace, 
who will empower you to be gentle with others as he is gentle with you. Let's pray. Lord, I just ask you to change our minds and our hearts as we reflect upon the gospel, that you would create humility in our thinking, that you would make our hearts tender. And I do pray for the men and women in here who have been going at each other in marriage, that there would be forgiveness, not just forgiveness from you, which is paramount, but even this week, even this day, even this morning, and asking a forgiveness from one another that either the husband will take the initiative and ask for forgiveness or the wife will take initiative and may they not be too proud to wait for the other. May they move out in humility and ask for forgiveness. And whether we're parents, we're dealing with children, we're dealing with our parents, so where we've been harsh with them, people at work, Lord, I just ask you to stir us up to receive forgiveness from you and from others and by your grace demonstrate the gentleness that we have found in the cross of Christ displayed in our lives by the power of the Spirit.